welcome Margaret McMillan. We're very honored that you're joining us today from Oxford in the UK. Uh, I think all of those participating in this uh, rapid format public conversation uh, know about your background. I'll simply say that you're one of the great historians of the 20th and 21st century that uh, you're associated particularly with great crises, the uh, First World War, aspects of other wars as well. And today's conversation gives us an opportunity to mention some other types of crises as well. Uh, Margaret has led a very distinguished academic institutions in Canada, in the United Kingdom, she was the warden of St. Anthony's College at Oxford, which is one of the greatest centers of learning on international relations and history thereon in the world. Uh, so you have a great authority with you uh, this evening. I thought we might start with the Spanish flu, Margaret, which coincided with the final years or year of the First World War. And although it killed many, many people, uh, it has always been secondary to the First World War in the way the history I learned was taught. And now looking back, I wanted to ask you whether there are any parallels with the current coronavirus uh, um, pandemic and whether there were any lessons learned from the Spanish flu. The influenza epidemic hit the world at a time when the world was already reeling from the impact of the First World War. I mean, it was a total war which affected societies in so many ways and, and affected large parts of the globe. Japan, of course, was an ally of Britain, France, and the United States in the First World War. And there's a lot of debate among historians about how much the influenza epidemic affected the ending of the war. We know that the German army in Europe was hit harder by the influenza epidemic than were the British and French and American armies. And that may have had an impact on the final collapse of the German armies, but they were collapsing anyway. And we know that perhaps as many as 50 million people around the world died as a result of the influenza epidemic, which very much hit people between about the ages of 26 and, and 32. So it carried off young and apparently healthy people. And the response to the influenza epidemic was very much actually like what we've seen today. Um, governments not knowing what to do, people not knowing what to do, a variety of responses. In some cities, uh, the public health authorities actually imposed quarantines and shut down public events. In other cities, they let them go ahead with, with the results you might expect. Some cities and areas were much harder hit than others. Did it leave a deep impact on society? And I think the answer, at least my answer, would be no. And I think that's for two reasons, partly because of the war, which was such a, a dreadful event for so many countries involved and had such an impact on the world. And I think partly also because in those days, people were simply much more used to end up epidemics, pandemics, to illnesses which we've almost eradicated like chickenpox and measles carrying off people. People I think were more familiar with deaths from disease than we are in our society. I, th I think we're shocked by the current pandemic because we haven't really, most of us experienced anything like it before. And if you look at the literature of the time, the memoirs of the times, the arts of the times, the surprising little mention of the influenza epidemic. It's not something that, that features in the arts and, and the thinking of the time, perhaps in a way that the Black Death much earlier did, the bubonic plague, or the pandemic, I suspect, of today will, will feature in how we come to think about this time and, and this period. Did governments learn from it? They were already learning, I think, in the course of the 19th century, that globalization meant the free movement of peoples and goods and money, but it also meant the free movement of disease. And so already by the middle of the 19th century, the world's governments are beginning to set up something called international sanitary bureaus and beginning to try and, and control the movement of people from infected areas. And so I think they were beginning to learn 
that international cooperation and coordination was very important. But of course, they had far fewer tools than we have today in the types of research they could do and, and in the types of cures and, and, and preventatives that they might be able to come up with. Indeed. Now, uh, um, another type of crisis altogether was the Great Depression starting in 1929 and rolling on uh, from there. Uh, and what it reminds me of today is governments not really knowing what to do. Uh, so Herbert Hoover, who was the president of the United States at the time, who almost certainly wasn't an evil man, made decisions that aggravated the economic crisis greatly without knowing that would be the outcome of his decisions. And so I wanted to ask you about, in your study of history, uh, this process of trial and error and how error gets corrected then. Yeah. I think it's very important that we don't get caught by conventional thinking. I mean, in ordinary times, we tend to go along in a certain way and we make certain assumptions and people working together have what, what the psychologists will call groupthink. Um, they tend to think in certain ways if they work in certain areas or certain ministries or certain industries. And when a sudden and major crisis like the Great Depression comes along, and, and there were warning signs, but we're not very good at looking at warning signs. There were certainly warning signs that the economy was overheating, that the stock market was going crazy, that there was far too much debt out there, which was not properly um, supported by, by real assets. I mean, the, the, these were warning signs which were there again in 2008. And we have a great capacity for explaining things away as a, as, a, as a species. What is dangerous, I think, when a crisis hits, if you continue to think in conventional ways about dealing with it, you often make it worse. And so in the case of Herbert Hoover, I mean, the orthodoxy at the time was that governments should balance their budgets, that low taxes were a good thing because it would stimulate the economy. And so what the American government did under Hoover and, and what other governments were going to try and do was rein in their expenditure, keep the taxes low, let people become unemployed, assuming that the economy would, would correct itself again. What they also did, and we're seeing it today, is take steps to protect their own economies. And so tariff barriers, um, but tariffs were imposed on goods coming into countries from competitors. Tariff barriers went up. The result was that between 1929 and 1932, world trade fell by over a half. And in the long run, of course, that was going to hurt the international economy and hurt individual economies and hurt individuals more than it would have been to, to let trade go on. And it took a while, I think, before governments began to realize that, in fact, they should be worrying less about balancing the books and avoiding deficits and taking on debt and should actually be thinking of ways to stimulate the economy. And so I think it, it took people like Roosevelt, President Roosevelt in the United States, who was by no means perfect, and he made a lot of mistakes, but he was prepared to try. And when he made a mistake, he was prepared to pull back. And I think it was Roosevelt's flexibility that really began to help the United States get out of the Great Depression. And what he also did was bring in very good people from outside government, people with new ideas, new ways of looking at things. And so I think through trial and error, the United States began to find its way out of the Depression what really stimulated the economy and, and took it firmly out of the Depression, of course, was something we wouldn't wish for, and that was the Second World War. And that was really, I think, when the Depression finally ended in the United States. But it was a very difficult period, and I think people in government and, and people in the universities, economists, had to unlearn what a, a lot of what they thought was, was standard operating procedure. And I think we're seeing something the same today. I mean, governments are behaving in ways which what you wouldn't have expected. I mean, the British government, which a conservative government talking about austerity, is spending money freely, as if John Maynard Keynes were in the room telling them what to do. Very interesting. Now, uh, coming to the Second World War, I think when we think of the 20th century, uh, we, we think of the Second World War as the ultimate uh, war cataclysm of the century. And so what lessons might be learned from the Second World War? 
think one of the lessons that is learned from the Second World War is that governments have to trust their people. I mean, the trust has to be two way. A people that doesn't trust its government is not going to respond well to when the government tries to encourage it to do certain things. But I think governments also have to trust their people. And those societies in which there was a high level of trust between, mutual trust between governments and people, seem to have coped with the Second World War and the demands of war, which were enormous, of course, if you, if you were involved in it. It dragged in your people, it dragged in your economy, it dragged in your whole society coped better than those that weren't prepared to trust their people. And the British government, just to give you an example, had thought before the First World War that as soon as the bombs started falling on the big cities in England, the population would panic, they'd collapse, they'd rush out into the countryside, society would turn into anarchy. In fact, that didn't happen. The British government should have had more faith and trust in the British people. The British people endured the bombing, worked through the bombing, lived through the bombing, and society did not collapse. I think what's also important in a crisis is that people feel that they are sharing the burden of the crisis. And in the Second World War, again, those countries which had very successful rationing, such as Britain, helped to build a solidarity and a cohesiveness where people felt they were sharing in the dangers of war and the burdens of war, but they were also being treated fairly. And I think fair rationing, a fair allocation of resources was, was very important indeed. Of course, leadership matters. I think we're seeing today how important it is that you have good people in office. And I think leadership matters really in two ways. Leadership matters in the ability of the leader to talk to the people and explain to the people what's going on and to listen to the people. It strikes me today that many of the leaders, and I must say most of them seem to be women who have been most successful in dealing with the pandemic, have been those who have talked very bluntly, like Angela Merkel, in Germany or Jacinda Ardern in, in, um, in, in New Zealand have talked very bluntly to their people and, and told them what's, what, they, what they think they should do. And so I think the capacity of a leader to inspire and to communicate, and, and Roosevelt certainly had it in, 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 in the United States in the Second World War, is huge. But also the capacity of a leader to make decisions. And that's not easy. And I think it's sometimes harder in democracies because democratic leaders have to think ahead to the next election and no politician likes to be elected out of office. But I think a leader who is able to take the difficult decisions is the one that's going to help his country pull through it. The impact of war, I think, is, is enormous. And was, the Second World War was enormous on society. I don't need to tell people in Japan that. I mean, many people will have family memories of what that war meant to Japanese society. But I think the fact that Japanese society was able to rebuild itself and recover from the Second World War shows something about the cohesiveness and the ties which bound Japanese society together through a very difficult time and then afterwards through better times. Terrific. Well, Margaret was making the point before we started uh, with all of you that developing countries, of course, are the most vulnerable uh, to the current health cr public health crisis because fighting health crises uh, costs money. But uh, in the interests of getting as many questions from the audience as possible, uh, I want now to open it up to your questions. We have 15 minutes or so. We'll try to get to as many of you as possible. And Sandeep will moderate this, I think. So Sandeep, please, over to you. Thank you very much, Rector. Um, our first question today is from Hirono Yokichi from Seikai University here in Tokyo. The question reads, in the last century, we saw how global crisis or crises in general brought about authoritarian regimes in many countries. Um, we saw in Japan and Germany and China, Brazil and other countries. How do you prepare to prevent a threat to democratic institutions that can be caused by crises? That's a very good question and not an easy one to answer. I mean, I think Building democratic institutions and civil institutions is, is a slow business. And I think it has to be done in quieter times. You can't suddenly build these institutions when you need them. It takes a long period. It takes a recognition both of the, what I would call the rules of the game, the regulations, the laws that govern society, but it also takes a shared understanding of the norms, the values, the assumptions that hold societies together. And I think societies which have laid down both the norms and the institutions and the processes 
for democratic interaction have much more chance of surviving difficult times without turning to authoritarian rulers. Thank you very much. Um, the next question we have is from Meslin Popovsky, who's a professor at Soka University. He asks, um, Woodrow Wilson and Winston Churchill have been recently heavily criticized by the Black Lives Matter movement and previously by anti-colonial movements and anti-slavery movements. What do you think about revisiting the roles of history, of leaders in history? I think what we should be doing in history is always revisiting the past. History is something that is always being, well, I think is always being revised. It doesn't mean that there aren't true facts about the past. I mean, there are certain things that we know happened and other things didn't happen. And, and so I don't believe that in revising history, we should deny the reality of the past, but we change and we ask different questions of the past. I'm a woman. And when I went to university in Toronto as an undergraduate, there was no women's history. It wasn't a question that people were interested in. When the women's movement began, and, and women began to push for a greater share in, in society in the 19, late 1960s and 1970s, then women's history became something that people became interested in. So we're always revisiting the past. What I don't like is judging people in the past by the standards of today. I mean, I think we need to understand them as they are. That's not to condone or excuse them. But we need to understand who they were. Now, Winston Churchill is a very interesting example, and, and so is Woodrow Wilson. Both of them said things that we would disapprove of deeply today. They were certainly, in the case of Woodrow Wilson, convinced that black people were inferior to white people. I don't think Churchill's views are more com complex, I think. Um, Churchill certainly believed that the British Empire was a great institution and that many peoples in it were not yet ready to rule themselves. Does that mean we throw them out and refuse to consider them? I think, no. I think we consider them as people who were people of their times, who shared many of the biases of their times. And what I think we always need to remember when we look at the past and start judging people is that things we're saying right now today are going to be judged 50 years from now as being absolutely ridiculous or reprehensible. You know, times change and, and, and that's why history changes. Absolutely. I think no one could have prevented even COVID. So. Times do change all the time. Um, another question we have is from Marian Hara here in Tokyo. She asks, I want to know what wisdom you have to offer on our lack of preparedness for the climate crisis in front of us right now. What governments should or shouldn't do or think? Well, I think our record on climate is, is so mixed. I mean, I think there's a huge popular willingness to do something about climate change. And I think publics are willing to take changes to their standards of living, changes to their way of life, because I think there is a growing realization just how serious this is. My worry is that we don't see the leadership at the moment. And there's a lot of grassroots activity, but I think you need leadership as well. And the fact that the United States, one of the most powerful, perhaps the most powerful country in the world, is not taking climate change seriously under this present administration, I think is very worrying indeed, because this is something that has to be coordinated internationally. Climate change is not going to be nicely restricted just to one part of the world. It's going to affect us all, and we're all feeling it. I and mean, we're all aware of the, the sudden swings in, in temperature, the, the sudden violent episodes in, in weather that we're getting. And I think you know, we're, most of us are aware in our own lives that something is, is changing and has changed. But at the moment, I, I'm concerned, and I think there is a, a game, you know, part of being human is we can only worry about so many things at once. And we're worried about the pandemic, we're worried about the economy. We've taken our eyes off, I think, what is going on with climate change. And I agree, it's, it's a huge existential challenge to the human race. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is, um, crises of the past were often overcome through international cooperation. This however, seems sadly scarce in our times. What hope do you have that international cooperation can emerge, revitalize through this crisis? I have some hope. I prefer to be an optimist rather than a pessimist. And my hope is that we are seeing firsthand in real time what the failure to deal with the crisis internationally is. Uh, the, the fact that we, it took us all too long to begin to deal with the movements of people, to deal with um, testing for, for people who might have COVID. It took too long for the Chinese government to let the rest of the world know about what was going on in Wuhan. It, we now see a very unfortunate blame game with governments blaming each other and blaming others. And what we're also seeing is, is a really appalling scramble for vaccines, selfish 
scramble for vaccines, which of course is going to hurt the poorer countries. Um, you know, and it's so foolish because the virus is going to pay no respect to borders in any case. And, and so of course we need to work together. What I find encouraging is that we do recognize this, many countries do. The fact that the United States is, is not taking leadership at the moment is, is regrettable, but there are many in the United States who would like to see something different. And I think there are many other countries in the world, I mean, Japan certainly, and, and my own country, Canada, which are continuing to think internationally. So let's hope that some of the other powers can begin to work together. Thank you very much. And that question was from Sandy Lapokjar in Berlin. Sorry for having not mentioned that previously. The next question is from Hiroki Shibuya in Japan. Um, he asks, he's interested in the impact of COVID-19 to capitalism um, and governments in general. He says that um, the COVID-19 could impact governments in the sense that we see a lot more government intervention to markets and other places. Do you think this could become a trend that there's going to be more big government as we go forward? Well, I think there might well be. I mean, I think we've already recognized the limits of small government. And one of the things that is striking when the pandemic started is, is there was a cry for government to do something, government to intervene. And I think what is perhaps encouraging is how societies have accepted a high degree of government control. I mean, in the United Kingdom, where, where I now happen to be, people actually were starting to isolate themselves and quarantine themselves before the government asked them to do it. And I think people have been looking to the government for more action, more intervention. And the fact that governments have intervened to prop up the economy to try and prevent an economic disaster from following on a public health disaster, I think is very important indeed. And so I think we are recognizing that government has a very important role to play. And perhaps the we will see the end or at least the dwindling of this neoliberal enthusiasm for small government and for assuming government's the enemy. I think we're now recognizing that we need government and the alternatives are pretty grim if we don't have good government. Um, the next question is from Fabian Löwenbeck from Austria. He asks, um, in the current situation, we see a restriction of movement and things like that, um, which is, and he feels that this could resemble a restriction of human rights as well, essentially. How do you see this in looking back at history? I don't think the two are incompatible. And I think human rights are extremely important, but I think we accept restrictions on our ability to do things because we are part of society. And I think we, we recognize that if we want to prevent ourselves from doing harm to others, then we have to do things like putting on face masks. I mean, the, 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 the wearing of face masks, which I think is much more widely accepted in Asia than it is in many other parts of the world, it seems to me is not an infringement of human rights. It's you showing your responsibility for other members of society. And that's why I think, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a false distinction to say that we have either human rights or we have, we, we have restrictions on our freedom. We all accept some restrictions on what we can do and can't do. I can't pick up a gun and go and shoot someone just because I happen to feel like it. And I think that's a very useful restriction because I would probably shoot the wrong person in any case, and I shouldn't be able to do just what I feel like. And so I think, you know, there is always this balance in societies between mutual respect and, and care for each other and, and human rights, but human rights doesn't necessarily trump everything else or should trump everything else. Absolutely. Um, the next question is from R. Salonga. Um, this person asks, you've mentioned that older generations are more used to and exposed to crises such as pandemics, epidemics, and other such situations. Do you think this is applicable to how developing countries have responded to this crisis? I think it's a very interesting parallel. And I think from everything that's come out of, say, South Africa or, or Zimbabwe or other, other sub-Saharan African countries, they have already been responding to major public health crises over a number of years, um, HIV AIDS has, as, as, as many know, been you know major challenge to, to health systems. And I think malaria is another one in certain parts of sub-Saharan Africa. And so I think both governments and people in Africa are more used to the government taking control of public health measures and more used to communities themselves taking responsibility for their own health. And yes, I do think that in fact, Africa, many African countries have dealt successfully with the pandemic because of their previous experience. Um, the next question is from Sam Kramer in San Francisco. He asks, in light of the Great Depression and the stock market collapse, what do you make up of the uncanny run-up of the American stock market throughout the pandemic until recently? And what of conspiracy theories that governments and shadow organizations may have been interested in artificially propping it up 
especially just before an American election. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I can believe you know, that the American administration might want to do it, but the idea that they could keep it secret seems to me totally improbable. This is the leakiest administration I've ever come across. Um, you know, nothing happens in the White House that isn't immediately made public. I think the, it, I think what is, uh, people are now beginning to say, and I'm no economic expert, but what are they beginning to say about the um, increase in, in, in the value of equities in the United States is it's concentrated on a very few companies, um, mostly dot-com companies, mostly um, companies like Tesla. And if you look at the underlying strength of the American economy, if you look at the return on, on investment, it's not great. And so that people are investing in stocks in a very few stocks, I think partly in a, in, in, out of a sense of desperation to try and protect their, their holdings. But if you look at the American economy as a whole, I think it's less healthy than, than, than you might think from what's look, from looking at the stock market. Yeah. Um, and this will be our final question for the day. We think we've covered a great deal of top, topics. Um, this question is from Raj Sampal in Hyderabad. He asks, what crisis that you've studied in history, apart from those that we've already mentioned, most resemble the situation we face with COVID-19? I suppose the one that is closest, if you go back into the past, is, is the bubonic plague. Um, the Black Death, which had affected a lot of Central Asia and Asia, hit Europe in the middle of, of, of the 14th century, and it had a tremendous impact. I mean, it's estimated that maybe a third of Europeans died. And historians are still debating among themselves. We love debating among ourselves, so we, we, we do this all the time, about how much that permanently altered European society. Um, very little was known about how to treat it, but they did use quarantining. They did have plague doctors. They did use whatever measures they had to hand. And what seems to have happened is that it began to undermine feudalism because suddenly the value of your, your peasant farmer or your, your laborer got much more valuable because there were so few of them. And so it did begin to improve the position of the working classes and began to undermine the big landed proprietors. So that's probably the closest parallel I can think of. Thank you. Many thanks, Sandeep, for moderating. Margaret, above all, many thanks to you. It's been a wonderful tour d'horizon. And uh, it brings out to me just how not only important, but enjoyable history is. History mm -hmm. allows us to interrogate what we believe constantly and provides us with all sorts of uh, evidence and bodies of ideas and past debates relevant to today's events that enrich our lives fundamentally and that cause us to grow as human beings. I think. Uh, so it's been wonderful during my lifetime to see uh, a flowering of history and a great deal of value attached to the importance of history in the body of study uh, in uh, universities uh, today, uh, all over the world, and uh, also I think within societies, a lot of individuals are interested in knowing more about the past of their own country or the past of their continent or other parts of the world. And you make it all so very exciting in very little time. And I think that's an encouragement to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. I very much enjoyed it. And I thought the questions were, were really challenging and I enjoyed them. Thank you. Thank you very much.